Televiziunea Română, întâlnirile JTI și Fundația Art Production vă recomandă garantat 100%. Salutare! Bine v-am regăsit la Garantat 100%. Invitatul nostru din seara asta este profesor de istorie și studii clasice la Cornell University și la Hoover Institution. E unul dintre cei mai mari experți din lume în istorie militară antică. A scris și a editat numeroase cărți, dar și articole care au apărut în cele mai prestigioase publicații americane. Două dintre cărțile sale cele mai cunoscute și apreciate au fost traduse și în limba română la editura Humanitas. Războiul Troiei, o nouă istorie, și Războiul lui Spartacus. Două cărți absolut excepționale, care vă propun o lectură pasionantă. Doamnelor și domnilor, suntem onorați să-i spunem bun găsit la Garantat 100%, domnului profesor Barry Strauss. Professor Strauss, good evening, thank you so much for accepting this invitation. Oh, uh, you're welcome, it's a pleasure to be here. My first question would be, Do we have, do we as human beings, do we have a permanent need of new perspectives on history? Is this present in each generation or does it have a cyclical recurrence? Well, that's a great question. I think we certainly do have a need to reinterpret history in every generation. Uh, the past speaks to us in different ways. I know just just teaching my students who are a bit younger than me, of course, they look at the past in different ways and they ask different questions about it. And I myself ask different questions about the past that I would have uh, 30 or, or 40 years ago. Uh, you ask if it's cyclical, and I, I suppose it is. I do think that history is cyclical. It, it, does, uh, it does go in recurrences. And you can certainly see changes between periods of war and peace, prosperity and, and poverty. Um, demographic changes also make us Uh, change the way we look at history. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes. When we talk about narratives, um, mm -hmm. storytelling, and each boundary that we can find in between fiction and reality, where is the contemporary way of understanding history? Where do you place it? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, it's different in the academy and um, in the, for, the, for the more general public. I think in the academy, there's an idea that if history is too readable, that it will mislead you. Um, so it needs to be as straightforward as possible, at least in the, in, in the Anglo-American world, I think there's that in a true church history and probably in the, in the German world as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I think when writing history for the public, well, first of all, I don't agree with that point of view. I think it's, it's, it's an illusion to think that you can have absolutely objective history that you must strive for it uh, but great historians throughout history have picked and chosen they don't give us all the information they they select the information they create it they turn it into a narrative there's history that it, there, there's chronicles of the past there's record keeping it's all very important but we have to weave it into a story we need to find meaning out of it history is a way of making meaning of the past and speaking to the present so Uh, it can't simply be a chronicle. It needs to bring in narrative, and you have to use some of the art of the storyteller to be a good historian. Do we have an academic history and a history for different types of audiences, for the people, let's say? To some extent, we do. To some extent, we do. Uh, I think the boundaries have become more flexible, and academia, uh, which was uh, very suspicious of Uh, popular history, I think, is now uh, the boundaries have broken down some. Interestingly, in the United States, these boundaries were never so strong for American history as for European and Asian history. And that's because in the United States, American history has always had a national part of a nationalist project, you know, to create a national identity. I'm not sure that American historians are always um, conscious of it, but I think it's certainly a very big part of what they do. And so, um, 
in American history, American, academic American historians have always been more ready to accept academics writing for the general public than, say, European historians have, or classical historians, or Asian historians. But that's changing right now. I'm just thinking at this very moment, I'm thinking of some of my compatriots who might tell you something like this. Uh, Professor Strauss, history means undeniable facts. Otherwise, you cannot call that history. Uh, just give me undeniable facts. Can a historical fact be undeniable? Well, some facts are undeniable. Yeah, sure. Some facts are absolutely undeniable. But it turns out that fewer of them are undeniable than we might think. You know, if a, a moment's reflection will say when we come to the ancient world, they're just huge gaps. And we either have to say we don't know or we can try to engage in educated speculation. I can explain what I mean by educated speculation. Yep. But I do, want to, I do want to point out that even when we come to modern history, we have these problems. For example, why did Germany go to war in 1914? Right. You would think we know the answer. And you would think especially we know the answer because we have the diary of the secretary, the personal secretary of the German chancellor, uh, Beckmann Hodrick. We have the diary of Kurt Lietzler. That should answer all these problems. But it doesn't. We can read what he says and what he thinks his boss was thinking, and it still leaves us with a big question as to what really was going on. It's even more of a problem, of course, when we go to the ancient world. And what some of us try to do is to say, well, you can't really tell you undeniably what happened. But we can tell you the way people in the ancient world thought, the way they worked, the way they acted, and how it's different from the way we do today. We, we do those things today. And so we can suggest a plausible explanation, even though we can't be 100% sure of, of what happened. We can do it one of two ways. We can either say again and again in the writing, maybe, possibly, um, or we can say in the introduction, this chapter is speculative and mm -hmm. take it with a grain of salt. I guess I prefer the first way. I like to tell the reader everywhere where, where we are and what we do know and what we don't know. But I, I think it's legitimate to engage in informed speculation. Uh, what, as scholars, we're saying we've trained for years and years and years, and we know this evidence, and we can come up with a plausible explanation, even if we can't give you an undeniable explanation. You call one of your books The Trojan War, a new history. How can a scholar build, produce, uh, create, reveal a new history of an event from a very, very distant moment in time? With the Trojan War, of course, it's a really difficult problem of all sorts of reasons. But uh, archaeology has really been tremendous in the last 40 years, I'd say, 30, 40 years. It's really given us a great deal of new information both about the city of Troy and about the world in which the Trojan War took place, yep. the world of the late Bronze Age. Homer does not really tell us about the Bronze Age. He tells us about a later period of Greek history uh, that was less heroic, less grand, where everything was on a smaller scale. I really think this took the mood of the world after the Second World War. But at the end of the 20th century, uh, with the end of the Cold War, I think people were willing to look at this story in a different way. I also think that the enormous demographic changes in Europe and migration from other, from Africa and Asia, and the case of Germany, particularly migration from Turkey, made people look at the Trojan War in a different way and tell the story in a different way. How much mm -hmm. poetry is in Homer and how much history is in Homer? Well, you know, I can't give you a percentage. I would certainly say there's more poetry than history in Homer. And if you had to choose, if I said a student can read poet Homer as poetry or history, but not both, I would say read it as poetry. It is magnificent poetry that really stirs the human spirit. That being said, the listeners to poems like, like Homer's Antiquity thought this was their history. They thought this was the memory of the Greek people. This was their past. And so it wasn't just any old story that he was making it up, but he was telling the traditional mm -hmm. story that had been passed down for generations. And when scholars look at Homer, um, they find all sorts of amazing things there that 
don't fit his age. For instance, the names of the characters in Homer are like the names that we find in tablets that come from the late Bronze Age. Uh, but they're not like the names of the Greeks in the early period of the city-state. There are places in Homer that uh, existed in the Bronze Age but don't exist in the city-state. And of course, there are customs, there are ways of fighting, there's uh, arms and armor that exists in the earlier period, but, but not in the city-states. Is Homer the person, the character that we know? I mean, is he the blind poet, the archetype, the, that idea that we know, or is he who we know he was? I think Homer is part of a guild, a tradition of bards, of oral poets going back many centuries. He is at the end of this period uh, when the poems can be written down and the, the existence of writing changes things quite a bit, but he's drawing on this tradition, these stories that go back so many, many centuries. So um, a blind poet, well, I don't know that he was blind, that's a nice story, but certainly a poet who is composing in a way that's, that's very foreign to us today, but that scholars have, have found others, other examples of mm. in the world. It's the world of all composition and all poetry, and it's very different than the world of writing. Professor Strauss, an archaeologist gives you a metal or a stone seal. You get that seal and you tell a world just from a single object. You recreate a world, a universe, just from a single object. How is this possible? Because, I mean, the skeptics could tell you how can you do that? How can you see through that object a whole world? What would you answer? I would say, you know, if you don't have any background in it, you can't and you'll make a mistake. But if you have studied the culture that it comes from intensively and try to learn as much as possible about it, then I think you really can say uh, a great deal about that world from the seal. I mean, imagine if you found a dime uh, you know, or, or a euro in the future, uh, <laughs> 2,000, 2,500 years from now. Yep. And um, suppose you found euros from different countries and you notice, gee, the coins are different. They have different images on them from different countries. What does this mean? What's it all about? If you knew nothing about Europe, you probably wouldn't know. But if you knew a lot about the EU and European societies, I think you could recreate a world from, from in the world. I think I think it would be possible. Yeah. So I tried to do something similar. Helen of Troy, Manolos, yeah. Agamemnon, yes. Achilles, uh, Patroclus, Hector, Odysseus, mm -hmm. Andromache. Who were these guys? I mean, were they real? Well, short answer is we don't know. Uh, long answer is the ancients thought so, and they weren't stupid. Uh, they thought they were real. Um, and um, society, oral cultures can re remember names. Names are one of the easiest things for them to remember. So also these names are by and large not names that they used later in a later period. They reflect an earlier society. Uh, and in a place like Sparta, Helen and Menelaus are, are worshipped as, as founders, as heroes of the past. Um, there's enough tradition in that place that they could actually have existed. That being said, the image of them that we get in the poems is, of course, it's very creative and fictional. We have to be very cautious about uh, believing anything that Homer tells us. But we do know that uh, in the late Bronze Age, international politics was personal. And dynastic marriages, dynastic rivalries was what international politics was all about. So when Homer says there was a time when uh, Greeks and Trojans went to war over a, a, a dynastic quarrel uh, over the seduction of a queen, yeah, it's possible. It's possible. It fits the mindset of this society. Professor Strauss, why is the Trojan War so important 
it's fundamental to us because it was fundamental to the Greeks. And, you know, the Greeks are at the foundation of Western civilization. Now, it's a complicated story. It's not just the Greeks, but I think the Greeks are the most important. Uh, and they consider the Trojan War the beginning of their story. Their, their later historians like Herodotus and Thucydides saw themselves either explicitly or implicitly in competition with Homer. Uh, and Plato saw himself as the anti-Homer, the guy who was going to cure Greece of mm -hmm. Homer. And Socrates saw himself as Achilles. So if we really want to understand the Greeks, we have to understand the, the Trojan War. Um, also, it's important because it is this, well, it, the Iliad and the Odyssey are at the beginning of Western literature. Uh, they're not a beginning. They're an end as well as a beginning. They certainly owe a lot to earlier literature from the Near East, such as the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, but they are, the, at the beginning of Western literature, we have uh, a clash of civilizations between the East and the West. And this is just such a major theme in history to this day. Uh, that the Trojan War, I think, is very important for us. Well, we don't have the word Greeks in Homer. No. He doesn't use the word Greek. Right, right, right. Um, at the same time, if we take this convention and we use Greeks, uh, you say mm -hmm. at a certain moment, the Greeks were the Vikings of the Bronze Age. Please explain yes. that. Okay. So, of course, I am using historians' license to talk about the, the Greeks. Um, I could call them the Achaeans or the Danaeans or the Argives. I'm not sure my readers would know what I was talking about. <laughs> uh, but um, And the, the, the classical Greeks didn't call themselves Greeks either. They called themselves Hellenes, as do the modern Greeks. But oddly enough, until the 20th century, most modern Greeks called themselves Romans, Kwamei. Uh, and they're still in modern Greek today. There's a word for Greekness, um, kind of popular culture. It's called Romeosine, Romanness, which seems really odd. Uh, so these things are kind of complicated. When I call them the Vikings of the Bronze Age, I meant that they were people who went on war and trade. Yep. Uh, they went raiding and trading, uh, just like the Vikings would do in the later period. Professor Strauss, just in a nutshell, maybe, what are the relevance and the profound sets of meanings that the Trojan War can have in contemporary times? I mean, what can we do now at this very moment with the Trojan War? What can that event tell us? Oh, it can tell us a number of things. Of course, it can tell us that people remember the past and need to remember the past. When we think of all the vicissitudes and all the things that got in the way of the Greeks remembering this war, it's remarkable that they that they did remember it. Um, and it was so important to their identity. But I think we have to approach the war through Homer. And I think that Homer is one of the most profound and moving things ever written about war and about death. The Trojan War is one of the great examples in history of the limits of heroism and the limits of conventional warfare. One of the, the, the great irony of the Trojan War is that it's not won by Achilles and it's not won by any of the battles in the Iliad. The Iliad is about a few months in the ninth year mm -hmm. of the war. And they're not decisive at all. In the end, the Trojan War is uh, won by a trick by the Trojan horse. We hardly even hear about that in the Iliad. We learn more about it in the Odyssey and more yet in the Aeneid which is based on another epic poem that, that didn't survive, that would have told us uh, about, the, about the Trojan War. So the Trojan War is also a, an example that wars, well, as, as it says in the Bible, the race is not to the swift. Wars are not won by, con, necessarily won by conventional means. They're won by cunning. And that's a lesson that uh, we would do well to remember today. Was the famous Trojan horse real? <laughs> Well, I would say that almost all of my colleagues would deny that it was real, and even some of the ancient Greek writers denied that it was real, but I think it was real. I think uh, the Greeks won the war through a trick. We have examples of tricks being used to win warfare from the Bronze Age, from writings from Mesopotamia, from, from Anatolia. We don't have anything quite like the Trojan horse, 
but I have no trouble believing that the Greeks won the war by persuading the Trojans that they had left and then sneaking back at night and taking the city unawares. We know that people did that in ancient Mexico. So the Trojan There's horse no... is a figure of speech. I don't know if it's a figure of speech. No, they might have actually really had a Trojan horse. But I, in a way, it's a red herring. The really important thing is that the Greeks left and the Trojans were convinced they were left. Whether they left a horse behind or not, I'm not sure. But it's such a powerful symbol. And of course, uh, we use it today to talk about computer viruses, how vulnerable we all are to a trick uh, winning a war. I think it's It's kind of inconvenient. It's, it's kind of, to me, paradoxical that we military historians spend so much time talking about conventional warfare and forget that the most famous war in history, at least in ancient history, is won by a trick. <laughs> <laughs> um, in 2004, Wolfgang Peterson directed a film called Troy. Yes. It has a uh, flamboyant cast with Brad Pitt. Eric Bana, right. Brian Cox, Peter O'Toole, etc., etc. Um, right. What do you think about that film? Oh, it's a lot of fun. I mean, I, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, the one thing they did historically that I really admired is they talked about, they showed the battle for when the uh, Greeks arrived at Troy. There's nothing about that in Homer or the epics, but it's in Thucydides. Thucydides says the Greeks must have fought a battle when they arrived at Troy. And they they dramatize that in the movie. The, the, the way they have the battle fought is not really the way you would have fought in the Bronze Age. But I give them credit for, for dramatizing that. Uh, and otherwise, well, the movie's more more fiction than, than fact. But um, I think Brad Pitt was not a bad Achilles, to tell you the truth. Uh, he certainly captured the arrogance of Achilles and the degree to which Achilles thought he was not only the greatest warrior, but the best looking warrior. I mean, that, that, uh, that aspect of it comes through rather well in the movie. You know what's very interesting? Your book was printed in 2005. The right. film came out in 2004. But yes. in a very intriguing way, um, When reading your book, I saw with the eyes of my mind, your mm -hmm. characters were very similar to <laughs> the look of the characters in the movie, the way they wear their hairs, uh, the clothes. I mean, um, the way they looked in some moments. And I was astonished and, and I said, well, those guys from the film inspired themselves from the book. But the film is a little bit earlier than the book. Yes, yeah, the chronology doesn't work. Um, was I subliminally affected by the film? I hope not. Uh, I do think they made an effort to try to make their characters look uh, the way people might have looked at the time. And we certainly have a lot of art from late bronze, from the late Bronze Age. And there's this, this magnificent fresco that was mm -hmm. discovered not very long ago in the in the late 20th century from Mycenae that shows either a very aristocratic woman, noble, royal woman, or a goddess. And uh, that's how I describe, uh, that's how I describe Helen in the book. I use that uh, as my uh, description of, my description of Helen. Professor Strauss, who was Spartacus? Spartacus. <laughs> Spartacus is another icon. Uh, of course, an icon of Hollywood, but more importantly, an icon of revolutionary politics. I should have said, uh, except Kirk Douglas, who was Spartacus, in fact? <laughs> Spartacus was a rebel against Rome. He's just one in the very long line of rebels against Rome. He was a Thracian, so he came from what is nowadays could be Bulgaria, it could be northeastern Greece, it could be European Turkey, uh, and Uh, he was an ally, fighting in an allied unit in the Roman army. Uh, and he ended up as a slave, either because he defected and fought against the Romans, or uh, because he was captured by an enemy when fighting on behalf of the Romans. And although he expected the Romans to buy his freedom, instead they bought him as a slave and, and uh, cruelly sent him off to Italy and then uh, sold him to be a gladiator. Uh, and he leads this rebellion as 
as a gladiator again against the against the Romans. And it's the most famous slave rebellion in antiquity. It's not a success in the end, uh, but it scares the Romans to death and uh, has a big impact on their consciousness. Will you give me um, a little shine of hope in telling me that when you say that Spartacus um, could have been from Bulgaria, northern Greece. <laughs> can you tell them, that, that, is it possible that we can dig a little bit more and say, could have been a part of actual Romania, Bulgaria, or something like that? C can you give me this hope? I will give you that hope. Thank you. you that. The borders of Thrace were sufficiently parsed. And as I said it before, I thought, how... Um, uh, impolite of me not to say not to add Romania <laughs> <laughs> okay um, let's talk a little bit about the multiple understandings of the word hero when you say hero yeah. in terms of history what do you understand so for the Greeks a hero was a religious figure he was the founder of a, a city and uh, he was semi he was semi divine uh, for us Nowadays, you know, a hero is someone who has great courage and who takes a position on behalf of, of a larger group and is willing to risk his, himself and perhaps his life for, for a cause. And it could, be a, it could be a female as well. It could be a heroine. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, a man. But, mm -hmm. but courage is is a great thing. I think we underestimate it in our society. If we think of, um, since we've been talking about films, if we talk yeah. about Spartacus, the movie, that mm -hmm. movie is, if I'm correct, uh, 1960. Yeah. Um, it's directed by Stanley Kubrick. And yeah. did you try to get out of the impact of the film when you think of your audience? Yes, I mean, I, I certainly did. I mean, uh, I love the film, I admire it, but it's an artifact of the Cold War and McCarthy era uh, America and the response to M McCarthy era. Of course, it's based on a, a novel, a terrific novel written by yep. um, Howard Fast when he was put in jail briefly for not naming names uh, before Congress. Uh, so the film, I think, reflects that. Uh, and. and uh, I could go on and on about the, the wonderful things about the film, but it's not the story of the real Spartacus. The story of the real Spartacus is different, but also I think no, no less a wonderful story. And I wanted in the book to try to tell the story of the real Spartacus. So you have to be mindful of the many layers of culture of, of Spartacus. Comparing the story of Spartacus with the Trojan War, do mm -hmm. we know more about Spartacus <laughs> than we know about the Trojan War? That's a great question. I mean, I must have been a masochist to study these two subjects because they're both subjects about which we know relatively little. Yep. I suppose we may know a little bit more about Spartacus than the Trojan War. We, the historical evidence is very poor for Spartacus, but it, it is by bona fide historians who lived at the time or at least had sources right in the time. The archaeological evidence is very weak. We have infinitely better archaeological evidence for, for the Trojan War than we do for than we do for Spartacus. Do we find any relevance, any trace of truth in two famous syntagms? The first is history repeating, and the second one is learning from history. Yes, well, uh, I do think history repeats. I think it is cyclical. Um, you know, I'm old enough to sometimes be shocked by some of the things that my students and my own children have said. And I thought, how could you not know this? <laughs> and I realized they weren't around in the 1970s and 1980s. So they didn't see it. But I see some of the same ideas and problems coming back. And I realized people are going to have to learn hard lessons again, because, uh, because they didn't see them the first time. I think history history does repeat in that sense. As far as learning from history, yes, but we have to be cautious. Uh, as uh, some of my colleagues say, history is good to think with. 
it gives us the tools to think with. And it asks us, it tells us, informs us about the questions to ask, but it, it doesn't give us simple uh, lessons. It's a bit more mysterious. It's a bit like the Delphic Oracle. It will tell you things, not really sure what they mean, and you have to use your wit to try to figure out what they mean. You yourself, you're talking about the Oracle. If yes. you know that history is cyclical, if yeah. you know that history repeats itself, if yes. you know that some events are similar, yes. can a good historian make a good forecast or a decent forecast of what will happen? Yes, history will give you some of these ideas and some of these cycles, uh, but it won't tell you everything. Another thing that we know from history uh, this is something we get from the ancients, uh, is that luxury and wealth uh, can have a very negative effect. It can have a positive effect of making people prosperous and enjoying a good life, but it can have the negative effect of making people soft and letting their guard down. Uh, the ancients write about this, Rodotus to a great extent, but many people since then have. Ibn Khaldun, uh, the great Arab thinker of the Middle Ages, writes about the cycle of civilizations, uh, Vico, the Italian thinker of the 18th century does, and Toynbee did in the, in the 20th century. So I'd say it was pretty predictable when you get uh, the United States and some European countries that are really wealthy and enjoying the good life, pretty predictable that someone is going to challenge them militarily and that they will um, find it challenging to respond to the military challenge. So those sort of things are predictable, yeah. If I tell you something like the better we live, so the better conditions we have in our lives, the mm -hmm. more possible a conflict is. How would you answer to that? Absolutely. I mean, this is what Ibn Khaldun talks about. He talks about how civilizations uh, grow wealthy and uh, prosperous and luxurious and soft. And there will always be people out there in the desert who are hard and tough and poor and hungry. And they will ride in and try to conquer the softer, more established and wealthier civilization. Uh, I think he's right. I think this is a totally predictable pattern in human history. So the challenge for the wealthier civilization is uh, to remember that it also has to defend itself and that it has to be aware of challenges coming out there. Sometimes you can meet the challenges by uh, making compromises with the new powers. The rise of new powers doesn't necessarily have to be stopped by violent means, but you, you always have to have the ability to fight them with violent means if necessary, so that you don't become victims. Can history be manipulated in order to serve at a certain moment to a certain group, to a certain culture? at a certain moment, to a certain nation. Oh, yes. I mean, this, this is a great danger in history and archaeology as well, of it being manipulated uh, for nationalist ends, for religious ends, for personal ends. Um, I think that historians have to try to be objective, as objective as we possibly can. But it's also sometimes valuable for historians to admit that nobody can be completely objective and to state up front and put on the table, look, this is where I'm coming from, and these are these are these are my ideas. But you know, a very wise teacher once said to me, we should be judging arguments by the power of the argument and not by the biography of the person. And I think that's true. Mm -hmm. I, I think that it's useful to know where a historian is coming from, but in the end, uh, the work has to stand or fall on the power of the argument. In terms of the audience, I mean, I put myself in the shoes, and I am in the shoes of the audience, as a matter of fact. What can one do in a very simple situation if now we have different types of training in understanding what's fake news? How can we train ourselves in order to understand when it's fake history? Well, I, I, I think I always tell people, tell students, they need to read skeptically. And as historians, we try to teach students to read skeptically and to have an adversarial relationship with documents. We're always in danger, especially in the world of digital technology, 
uh, and smartphones were always in danger of being taken in by information. But um, we need to treat everything skeptically. Everything's a potential Trojan horse. And uh, I don't want to sound too um, negative about history books, but we can read them with respect, but also thinking, is it real? Do I buy these arguments? Am, am I going to accept them? And then there is something to be said, going back to an earlier point of the, the academic point of view, which is you don't want history to be too well written, because if it's too well written, it can seduce you. Uh, just the facts. I hope that's not where we have to end up, but we do have to be uh, uh, aware of the danger of being seduced. Because in certain moments, history can be dangerous, yes, toxic, and Absolutely. can influence very important events and can drive very important events in a wrong way. I mean, yes, seducing people is a very complex phenomena. Can we be protected from fake history or from fascinating history? Because there are people who dive in a certain type of history and they become that type of story. They're not themselves anymore. They are that type of story. No. Well, it's a really great question. I would say it, it has to be a two-part thing. First of all, it can't be a passive thing. It has to be an active thing. Mm. We can't simply be protected from fake history. We have to protect ourselves from fake history. We have to be activist readers uh, and skeptical readers. That being said, I do think there's such a thing as an expert. And I think that we want to uh, try to put ourselves in the hands of experts. So we read book reviews in places that we respect, written by people we respect. And we try to seek out people with credentials uh, and to read, uh, to have more trust in their work than, than uh, we will uh, with others. I mean, credential people can get it wrong and we're, there's a danger that credential people uh, will um, engage in a kind of group think of the establishment. And sometimes it is the outsider who sees the truth, but there's no easy answer. But your, your question is a great one because I think we have to be aware of this, we have to be skeptical of it and realize that history is not just an academic pursuit, but it can be used by politicians and nations at the highest level. And as you say, in the most deleterious ways. So we have to be careful. About it. What's happening now in the world, Professor Strauss? What yeah. is it telling you? Um, how do you see all these stringent events through the eyes of an expert in ancient military history? What I try to do is to really get a variety of opinions. I really do. Um, I think that in the United States, there tends to be a sort of group think about how we think about things, as, as in any country. Mm -hmm. uh, there are minority opinions. Those minority opinions, I don't know, I don't always find them so helpful. So I try to read European press as much as I can. Um, some languages I can read, some I can read in translation. They have a very different take on things. And I all take take on things. And I also try to follow experts who know more about this than I do, while at the same time remembering that there are patterns from history. There are things we can we can learn from from ancient history. I mean, I've just written a book about the the Actium War, the Battle of Actium and the campaign around it. And, the war between Antony and Cleopatra on the one hand and Octavian yep. on the other is the great examples of misinformation and fake news in history. There's so much fake news there uh, that I find going back to it is a good reminder of how much fake there is, news there is today and how careful we need to be. Recomand cu mare căldură aceste două cărți, războiul Troiei, o nouă istorie, războiul lui Spartacus, cărțile domnului profesor Barry Strauss, sunt două cărți absolut fascinante și le mulțumesc prietenilor de la editora Humanitas pentru mijlocirea acestui interviu. Professor Strauss, it's been a privilege to have you as a guest in our show. Thank you so much for your books. Thank you so much for the way you're doing your job, as a matter of fact. <laughs> thank you. And uh, thank you for accepting this invitation. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Tuturor celor care sunt alături de garantat 100%, mulțumim frumos pentru încredere. Noapte bună!